We have come seeking comfort, inspiration, community, and insight. We have come to open ourselves to the power of God's presence in our midst. We have come to offer up our lives and to ask God's help in our learning and growing. Let us worship God together. God's word reminds us of human struggle we all face. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin. So now let us turn to God, ask him to be forgiven, cleansed from sin. Let's pray. We humble confess our sins and ask you mercy. We have not loved you with a pure heart, nor have we loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not welcomed the refugee, nor have we opened our arms to the strangers. We, we have, have not done, done justice, justice, love, kindness, kindness or walk humbly with you, our God. Forgive, forgive us, O oh God, reconcile, reconcile us to you by the power of your spirit, and give us the courage and strength to be reconciled to others. Through Jesus Christ, our Son, our Savior. Please take a moment for silence.
Sisters and brothers, Jesus crossed the border between divinity and humanity, entering fully into the suffering and brokenness of the world to reconcile us back to God. When the religious and political leaders tried to send him back across the border, Jesus bore our sins and the sins of the world on the cross. In the midst of betrayal, denial, torture, and crucifixion, Jesus hanging on the cross says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Who then is in position to condemn? Only Christ, and Christ died for us. Rose from the dead for us and prays for us. Sisters and brothers, trust and live the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Dios es amor. Dios, Dios es amor. Dios es amor. So, Dios is God. Dios is God. Es, is, amor. 
no, no.
heart that is here present today. May we testify to the light that others hearing us will open their eyes to see that light for themselves. We do pray these things in the name of and for the sake of Jesus the Christ, our risen Lord and only Savior. Amen. Our New Testament reading this morning is from 2 Corinthians 5, 11 through 21. That's on page 181 of the Pew Bible, or it should be on the screens as well. Listen now for the word of God. <clears throat> Since then, we know what it is to fear the Lord. We try to persuade others. What we are is plain to God, and I hope it is also plain to your conscience. We are not trying to command ourselves to you again, but are giving you an opportunity to take pride in us, so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than in what is in their heart. If we are out of our mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us, because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore... We are therefore in Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have been mightily blessed. We've been blessed by the invitation, by your session and your pastor to be here with you. We've been blessed by the wonderful welcome and smiling faces that we've received just this morning. Blessed by the gorgeous music and that lifted our spirits. Um, just blessed. And we're blessed to serve as your mission co-workers on the U.S.-Mexico border. It's a real honor and a privilege for us uh, to be in worship with you this morning Uh, and to be able to serve on your behalf on the U.S.-Mexico border. Uh, We bring greetings from your sisters and brothers on the U.S.-Mexico border and an invitation uh, to know that Nuestra Casa Su Casa, our home is your home. If you ever find yourself in the Southwest, know that you have a home on the U.S.-Mexico border. The scripture, second scripture reading today comes from Genesis 1. Uh, It's a very familiar uh, scripture. Uh, to to probably all of us, and I'll read portions of it. Listen for a word from God. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was formless and void. Darkness covered the face of the deep while while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And then on the second day, God created, and it was good. And on the third day, God created, and it was good. And on the fourth day, God created, and it was good. And on the fifth day, God created, it was good. And on the sixth day, God said, God said, so God created humankind in God's own image. In the image of God, God created them. Male and female, God created them. And God looked at all that God had created, and it was... No, it was very good. It was very good. This is, a, this is a, this creation hymn of God's powerful work at the beginning to create all that exists. 
is a litany, and it talks about God created, and God saw, and it was good, and God saw, and it was good, and God saw, and it was good, and at the very end, it says God saw all that God created, and it's not just good, it's very good, very good. Now, a friend of mine from seminary, um, when he was going, um, translating this from the Hebrew, he got to the word good, and good in Hebrew is tov, and he, he said, you know, I've never, now I have to do a disclaimer, I've never seen anybody else translate it this way. But to me, I think it's the best translation I've ever heard. And he said, good is just not enough. It's, it doesn't capture the essence of tov. Because, you know, we can say just about anything is good. You know, how was, you know, how was that hot dog you ate last night? Oh, it was good. Well, this is something different, my friend said. It's like, and God saw that it was, wow! It's not just, it's not something mundane. It's something extraordinary. Wow! And then when God saw all that God created, God said, wow! Now the beauty of this is that at the very end, God says, God created humankind in God's own image. God created them male and female. And God saw all that God had created, and God said, wow. So I want you to take a moment, and I just want you to look at your neighbor, and I want you to tell your neighbor, I want you to tell them, you are created in the image of God. Wow! You are created in the image of God. Wow! Now let's all say it together. You are created in the image of God. Wow! Now here's your task for this week. When you see someone on the street, no, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) But I do hope when you pass someone on the street, you might not say that to them exactly, but look at them like that. Look at them through the eyes that they are created in the image of God, and that's wow. You know, I have to admit, when I first got to the U.S.-Mexico border, I didn't exactly see the wildness of all of God's creation. You know, we were talking about how much rain that there's been. There was more rain last night than there is in a whole year where we live. Not, that's hyperbole. But there's not a lot of rain where we are. And when I first got to the border, I traveled from the, you know, the, I'm from Clover, South Carolina, which is about an hour south of here. And, you know, for me, trees and and green rolling hills, you know, that for me is life. And so I went in September and I traveled to the U.S.-Mexico border in the the high Sonoran Desert, and it was all brown. And it was just, I couldn't see any life there. And it was a little bit depressing. And there were no big trees. And I I had a hard time seeing the wildness of God's creation. And it didn't rain in September, and it didn't rain in October, and it didn't rain in November, and it didn't rain in December. And it seemed like it didn't rain all the way to May. And it was dry, bone dry. And then one day, one day I was driving up after what, almost eight, nine months on the border. I was driving up the highway, and I was going through this thing called an Ocotillo Forest. Valerie, do you know what an Ocotillo Forest is? Does anybody else know what an Ocotillo Forest is? Well, an Ocotillo, uh, Miriam does. An Ocotillo, now y'all tell me if I'm wrong here. An Ocotillo is like a Dr. Seuss plant. You look at it and you think, that doesn't belong here. It's like a bunch of these sticks sticking out of the ground, like going up like this, and it looks like kind of a bad hair day. And it's gray and it's thorny, and so after nine months, it, was, it looked dead. But you're going through, and there aren't about, they're about that high. And so you're, I'm driving up, and I look, and on the top of those seemingly dead sticks, what do you think was there? What was there? Flowers. Red flowers. And I said, Wow! I said, wow, I couldn't believe it. And it was the beginning of God opening my eyes to see the beauty of God's creation, even in places that I couldn't see it before. Being on the U.S.-Mexico border has is, is always been an amazing thing for me because you can see people who are coming from east and west, north and south. You can see that they're creating the image of God, and you can say, wow. 
Oh, if we live in the wildness of God's creation. And I wish, I so very wish, that God's story with us and our story with God ended in chapter 2 of Genesis. Are you with me? Yeah. In the wildness of God's creation. I wish that's where we stayed. But we know that God's story with us and our story with God doesn't end in chapter 2 of Genesis. It goes on and we get to chapter 3. And what happens in chapter 3 of Genesis? What happens? Yeah, I like this. He kind of goes, goes sideways and goes down. We have sin that enters the world. Adam and Eve, they turn their backs on God's intentions for God's creation. We get to Cain and Abel, and brother kills Abel. And humankind begins ripping at the very fabric of God's creation. The wildness that God created for us then gets spoiled by our own sin that enters into the world and the own, own brokenness. One of the hardest passages to read is in chapter 6 of Genesis. You get to chapter 6 of Genesis, and it's, 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 when, it's right before the flood. And God looks out of all, on all of creation. It says it again. It says, God looked down on creation, and God saw the wickedness of humankind. And it says, God was grieved in God's heart that God had created humankind. Oh. I'm looking at your beautiful stained glass. I just started doing some stained glass work. And I imagine if we, you were to show up this morning and someone had come in and thrown a rock through your stained glass, that probably would have been hurtful. And I know I just finished a stained glass piece right before leaving the border to come to, to Clover. And I had put a lot of work in it. And I'm not a great artist, but it was something I took a lot of pride in. And I loved it. It's told a story. And if someone would have just thrown that down on the ground and just broken it to pieces, I would have been heartbroken. And I would have been mad. And I would have been angry. But it wouldn't be a minimum part of how God must feel looking at how we have just turned our backs on one another. We're fighting with one another. Brother against brother. Sister against sister. Brokenness, not able to get along, not respecting God's creation, and God grieves. Now, you might, might imagine that on the U.S. Mexico border, we also see the brokenness of God's creation. I imagine if you hear in the news, you probably hear some pretty bad stuff on the news. You hear about drugs. You hear about people dying in the desert trying to come for work in the U.S. You hear, hear about brother turning against brother, fear, hatred. All of that's part of our reality as well. I want to tell two short stories about how we experience viscerally the brokenness of God's creation. I was looking at the children this morning and I was thinking about the children that we work with and and the ministry, uh, we have a children's enrichment ministry. And, um, and I, I thought about this uh, uh, during the sermon. If we would have asked the children, what do you want to be when you grow up? Right? What do you want to be when you grow up? Now, they're not here, so they can't answer that. But I could ask you, what did you want to be when you grew up? Valerie, what did you want to be when you grew up? A teacher. A teacher. Me too. Uh, what did you want to be when you grew up? Anyone else? A teacher, a soldier. a soldier, anything else? Uh, hygienist. Yeah. Did anyone say or think that you wanted to be a sicario, a hitman, when you grew up? No. no. The children with whom we minister in the communities on the outskirts of town, for some of them, they can verbalize that they want to be a hitman because of the culture that they grew up in, the poverty they encounter. That is a viable pathway for them. Our children's enrichment ministry is specifically made, uh, set up for children who are at risk of dropping out of school in elementary school. Because if you drop out of school in elementary school, then 
then you are on a pretty straight path to getting involved in some very bad things. Very early on in the ministry, I remember showing up, and there was a little boy, his name was Haciel, six years old. He was sweeping, and it was after the program had ended, and the director of it, Marina, said to, to Haciel, Ah, Haciel, uh, dile a Pastor Marcos que quiere decir G2. What, tell Pastor Mark what G2 means. Marina had uh, organized the kids into groups. This was the first year, and it was G1, G2, G3, kind of group one, group two, group three, but she did a G1, G2, G3, sound co- kind of cool. And when she asked Haciel to tell Pastor Mark what G2 meant, Haciel stopped sweeping and says, Pero por qué, maestra? Why, teacher? No, it's okay, Haciel. And Haciel said, Pero por qué? And Marina could see, and I could see that he was reticent to tell Pastor Mark what G2 meant. And so finally he looked at me and said, It means sicario, it means hitman. Marina and I didn't know the language of that community, didn't know that G2, group two, actually meant sicario, but a six-year-old. The brokenness of God's creation. When a six-year-old can know that G2 is a hitman. I also saw the children, and I, I thought about the children of Carmelo Cruz Marcos. About a year ago, almost exactly a year ago today, Carmelo Cruz Marcos left his home in Puebla, Mexico. He left his three young children with his wife and his daughter, I mean his wife and his mother, on his way to go work in Phoenix. His sister had told him that there was a job waiting for him in a golf course. Their house uh, leaked uh, in Mexico and he thought he could go and work and make some money and send back to them uh, to be able to have a roof that didn't leak for his children. And his sister said, come on up, there's a lot of work. And so Carmelo left about a year ago and journeyed to the U.S.-Mexico border. But he couldn't legally go into the United States, so he paid a, a smuggler to get him into the United States. And then about 36 miles outside of Douglas in the remote, beautiful part of God's creation, oh my gosh, the Peloncillo Mountains, he crossed way out there with a group of folks as they were traveling through, we went to the, the spot where they were going, and it took us 10 hour round trip after driving out there. But he had been walking for, for a long, long time, and at, in the middle of the night, he encountered, or the, our border patrol encountered him and the others, and he ended up getting shot four times and died on February the 19th of 2022. Just a year ago, he was leaving home with the hopes of being able to provide a roof that didn't leak for his children. Brokenness, despair, brother turning against brother. And I imagine God looks down grieving at how we just haven't figured it out. We haven't figured out how to live together in peace and harmony. But the good news, sisters and brothers, the good news is that God's story with us and our story with God doesn't end in chapter 6 of Genesis. It goes on, as, we, as our brother read this morning in chapter 2, um, chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians. It talks about what God did in Jesus Christ. In the midst of the brokenness of the world, God sent Jesus Christ into the world to reconcile us back to God. God didn't give up on us. Even the, in the grief of God's heart, God doesn't give up on us. God enters into the brokenness of the world to restore us back to God, to bring us back home. But one thing that I think is crazy, and I have to ask God, is God doesn't just fix it all. He doesn't just snap God's fingers and return it to Eden. God and Jesus Christ restores us back to God's self. And then what? Gives us the ministry of reconciliation. The very ones who have broken the wildness of God's creation, God 
sends back out into the brokenness of the world to be part of those who restore and reconcile that creation back to God's self. When we face the brokenness of the world, oftentimes our response is, oh, that's horrible. But if we're in Christ, it's not doesn't stop as it is horrible. It goes on and it says, God, what does it mean for me to be a minister of reconciliation in the brokenness of this world? What does it mean to me to be a minister of reconciliation when, when children think the best viable pathway for them is to be a hitman? What does it mean for me as to be a minister of reconciliation when someone doesn't feel like they have any other viable path to provide for their children than to cross the border without documentation. One of the ways in which Frontera Cristo is responding to the brokenness of the world, as I mentioned, is the children's enrichment ministry. It's a really amazing thing of, of reaching out to families who don't have a lot of support and re reaching out to their children who oftentimes hear the voice that where the money is, is in the drug cartel. And to be able to bring those children together in one spot and to be able to love on those children and to be able to share with those children that God is love and to be able to not judge them for saying, I want to be a sicario, but to give them opportunities to think about other things that they can be. That they can be teachers, they can be doctors, they can be hygienists. And to work with them to develop those skills and that self-esteem to think about what more can I be in this world that will bring life to me and my family and to the community. It's amazing what that ministry is doing in our community there. About 20 years ago, there was a woman named Soraida Santiago. Soraida Santiago had a similar experience to that of um, the mother of Carmelo Cruz Marcos. Her son had left, uh, left her community in the southern part of Mexico because the coffee prices had dropped so far down they couldn't make a living anymore. And so a lot of the young people in the community had left the community to come work in the United States. Thank goodness he didn't get shot and didn't get killed. He didn't die of thirst in the desert. He made it and he worked and he was roofing houses and he was sending money back and his children were able to stay in school. His children were able to have shoes and his children were able to have a roof over their head. They were able to keep going to school. But you know what? The children didn't have their father by them, their side. There was brokenness there. And Doña Soraida, she was 74 years old when she and 25 other coffee farmers got together and they said, you know what, if we controlled our coffee, we would be able to stay on our land. And she and these other farmers had this crazy vision that their families could actually live together and thrive together on their own land. And so they cast this vision of not only being able to cultivate great coffee, but also to be able to roast their own coffee and to be able to export their own coffee and sell directly to their customers and to reverse the migration from their community. It was a crazy vision. They didn't have resources. They didn't have education. But they had a vision for what they wanted for their community. And they cast that vision out. And there were people in different places that said, that sounds like a great vision. There were other Christians that said, yes, that sounds like a great vision. Can we work together with you? And they created this cooperative called Cafe Justo, Just Coffee. And now for 20 years, they've been roasting their own coffee and exporting their own coffee. On, in March of 2021, almost two years ago now, Doña Soraida died. She was 93 years old. She started an international coffee roasting business when she was 74. How many of you who might be over the age of 50 would like to start an international roasting company? Yeah, I'm going to talk to you. <laughs> she died a happy woman. 
her son Mundo, who was in Atlanta, Georgia, roofing houses, providing for his, economically for his family, when Cafe Justo started, had already come back home. He was able to watch his daughters go through middle school, go through high school, go through college, graduate. Doña Soraya died with her son by her side. She died with her granddaughters by her side. She, she, she died knowing that her granddaughters were the first, not only to graduate high school in her family, but to graduate college. And that one of her granddaughters was building a business in the community. Never would have they imagined that. And another was building her home in the community. Never would have they have thought that. But in the midst of the brokenness that they experienced, they had a vision to be part of God's reconciling work in the world. And because of that, that community is coming together and thriving and invites us in to experience that and to rejoice in that together with them. One of the, one of the things I love is when I go to different places and I see there are folks who open up their coffee cabinet and they have the names of the farmers on their coffee cabinet. And they said, every morning that I drink my coffee, I give thanks for Genaro and for Jaime and for Mundo. And they just have them all up there. The coffee growers put their names on their coffee bags. And they didn't know that this would happen. But people are praying for them all over the place. People who never would have imagined themselves being connected or connected over a cup of coffee. Sisters and brothers, I don't know what the brokenness is here in Bethpage or in Kannapolis, but I know that it exists. I don't know what's going on in your family, but I know our families are broken too. But what I do know is that Jesus Christ has come to reconcile each of us back to God and has given each of us the mission to be ministers of reconciliation, to be those who work to restore the wildness of God's creation. Wherever there's brokenness, say, God, Use me. How can I be a minister of your reconciliation in the midst of this brokenness? May God give us courage to do that today and each day of our lives. Amen.